Welcome to Couples Therapy in Seven Words. I am your co-host, Judy Alexander, and I'm here with my husband, Dr. Bruce Chalmer. Hello, Judy. Hello, viewers and listeners. Our topic for today is... If this is your authentic self, be somebody else. <laughs> yes, indeed. And, you know, I'll, I'll explain where that, that uh, okay. came from. That's actually the punchline to a, a funny little story, but I'll, I'll explain that in a bit. Before we do that, let's do our little introduction of uh, the the book that started all of this. We can start off with the book. Okay, it's Reigniting the Spark, Why Stable Relationships Lose Intimacy and How to Get It Back. Available anywhere books are sold. If you're interested in the kind of stuff we talk about in this podcast, you'll love this book, I think. Also available on audio and Kindle. All of the, all of the above. And we also would like you to spread the word about our podcast. Tell folks about it. Uh, re, you know, Engage with our social media posts, all that kind of right. stuff that people like do. Like us, follow us, share us. Et cetera, et cetera. Spread us around. And just tell your friends. Uh, more and more people are doing that, and that's mm -hmm. why we're kind of getting around more, it yes, sounds we like. Are. So let's get into our topic. Yes. What do you mean by saying authentic self? Yes. Well, let me tell you the the little joke is, is it too much to call it a joke that that comes from? I it's know. just a little, one of those little vignettes, you know, a, a um, literature, or not a literature, a writing teacher, mm -hmm. you know, like say a freshman English uh -huh. teacher is, is grading papers, you right. know, and writes on one student's paper, be yourself, and then stops and thinks for a moment and then writes, if this is yourself, be somebody else, <laughs> <laughs> which I've always enjoyed that little uh -huh. story. Because the concept of being your authentic self mm -hmm. is that's a biggie in, you know, in the therapy world, in the new age world, in all kinds of, you know, the, the zeitgeist of our culture, at least the zeitgeist right. of kind of Western culture. For a long time, uh, it goes back at least, I don't know, 75, 100 years, something like that. Sort of, you know, since the heyday of psychoanalysis and all that kind of stuff, kind of, you know, having a big effect on the culture starting in what would we say the 1930s 40s i don't know it's a bit before my time mm -hmm. just a bit just a bit, <laughs> just a bit. I, I don't mind telling you folks i was born in 1951 do the math um but that is uh that concept that we have such a thing as an authentic self that's one concept and that that's a good thing mm -hmm. is another concept and so what I want to talk about in, in this particular idea and we happen to have a listener letter and you know as always our listener letters I, I could have got them from my um, practice because this sort of thing comes up a lot in our, in our practice. People are, are saying, I just want to be my authentic self. And you go to individual therapy and individual therapy is all about, you know, you need to find your authentic self. And yeah. I got to be me. <laughs> exactly. I, I got to be, be me. There's a, a far side cartoon I'm remembering where it's this huge <laughs> cluster of penguins, you uh -huh. know, all identical penguins. <laughs> and I think he has one of them that he like made red or stood, stood a little bit about it and the caption is I gotta be me you know <laughs> so it's interesting that you know there's mm -hmm. there's two parts of that one is that there is such a thing as one's authentic self mm -hmm. and the other is that that's good not bad and so I want to give a shout out to um, somebody I actually mentioned in in the book that we held up a little while ago mm -hmm. uh, David Brooks the, uh, the yes. New York Times uh, columnist right. who a number of years ago wrote a book called The Road to Character. Mm -hmm. And what it is, is a series of vignettes of um, people from history, either long ago or, you know, like St. Augustine is one of them. And, mm -hmm. you know, there's like, people from a long time ago, also people much more recently, um, all of whom are examples of people who had to go through some kind of challenge to their character to build the character that they later became. And, you know, the... The interesting stories are the ones where it wasn't easy. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they went sure. through some kind of struggle. Yeah. And what Brooks pointed out that I really enjoyed, and that's why I quoted him in my book, you know, the idea that finding your authentic self, like, well, this is who I really am, that that should be a good thing, that's a pretty recent idea. The, a lot of cultures until, you know, however long ago you want to say, 7,500 years ago, whatever, said that the job of raising children mm -hmm. is to hem in that authentic self business, which can get you in a lot of trouble. In what way? In the sense that, you know, I might have the urge to do something that would be flat out horrible. 
were flat out horrible according to the definitions of my culture. I shouldn't give myself over to just whatever my whims are. That isn't necessarily a good thing. Now I realize when what people- What does that have to do with raising children? Well, that in raising children, you know, if you, if you don't somehow give them discipline, you know, mm -hmm. if you don't somehow rein in their impulses, mm -hmm. that's the point. Their authentic self would be just their impulses. They do whatever they darn well want to do. And if you don't rein that in, you're being a bad parent. And I mean, most people would agree with that on some level, that, you know, the job of parenting is in part to invite kids to limit what they do. Well, if you want to be a, a civil member of society, there are certain norms that you're going to have to adhere to. Yeah, yeah. Now, So that doesn't mean you can't be yourself, although that gets to the question, what is your authentic self? Because, ah. you know, people are different selves with different people. Funny you should mention. You, know. <laughs> <laughs> you, you can guess, perhaps you can guess who I'm about to invoke at the moment. Can, can you guess who I'm about to invoke at the moment? I don't think so. The notion that there you can be different selves, you said with different people, but different selves in general? Yeah. Jill Bolte Taylor. Ah, uh, Jill Bolte Taylor. Give a shout out to Jill Bolte Taylor, mm -hmm. who um, is, uh, for those of you who have um, seen her TED Talk, and lots of people have, I don't remember mm -hmm. what the number is, but it's a lot of people. It's a lot of people. Um, she's the one who, she's a neuroscientist. Uh, when she was in her 30s, she had a massive left hemisphere hemorrhagic stroke pretty young to have a stroke in your yeah. 30s, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, and she was already a neuroscientist, and gee, who better than a neuroscientist, given, thank God, she recovered, and it took her years to recover her, her capabilities from her left hemisphere, which right. include things like language. Uh, but given that she was able to recover it, who better than a neuroscientist to then write about the experience? And it's not just that she's a neuroscientist. She's got this particular sort of... Um, whimsical way of viewing the world that I just really enjoy reading and lots of people do. So her TED Talk, which you can find easily, um, it was the first viral TED Talk, is, crawl, is called My Stroke of Insight. Mm -hmm. And then she wrote a book with the same title, My Stroke of Insight. And then quite a few years later, just came out, I believe last year, she wrote a second book, which is called Whole Brain Living. And what she talks about, especially in Whole Brain Living, is that very thing you're saying. We're, we're not just one person. She talks about we're at least four people. Right, the four different parts of the brain. <laughs> yeah, four different parts of the brain, two on the left, mm -hmm. two on the right, you know, hemispheres, and two upper and two lower. And the lower ones, really, she's talking about midbrain stuff. Um, on the left side, lower one is the one that freaks out. Mm -hmm. It's the one in charge of seeing danger all over the place, you know, and, and over overreacting rather than underreacting. That's the part that freaks out. The one on the right side just wants to have fun, although it can be pretty impulsive about it because it doesn't give it a lot of conscious thought. The left side upper one is the one that gives a lot of conscious thought to things. Mm -hmm. The right side upper one is the one that is sort of at one with everything. Whereas the Buddhist said to the hot dog vendor, make, make me one, one with, with everything. everything. Right, yeah. yes, exactly, <laughs> yes. So that concept that we are multiple people mm -hmm. really stands in opposition to this notion that says, I have to find who I'm authentically and mm. live my most authentic life. Right. Because it's saying, well, they're all in there. All these parts are in there. And again, let me give a, a shout out to someone else while I'm okay. at it. Dick Schwartz, mm -hmm. you know, Richard Schwartz, who is the one who uh, founded a, a school of therapy, I guess I'd call it, called Internal Family Systems, <clears throat> IFS. Mm -hmm. And it's founded on similar kinds of ideas, not so much specifically physiologically based, but he talks about the fact that we're all a bunch of people walking around. You know, there now look, I folks who have uh, I may have said this in some other podcast or whatever and folks who know me know this, in my career I've had the occasion of working with people who have dissociative identity disorder, mm -hmm. which is also known as multiple personality disorder. Right. And uh, that's a fascinating phenomenon and what makes that uh, grounds for therapy as opposed to just an interesting way of living is that it can really be chaotic because some of the parts don't know about other of the parts. It's the dissociative part that makes it so difficult. But what Dick Schwartz points out is we all have multiple parts. They're not dissociated. Right. You know, if you see me, well, you do see me talking to my grandchildren as opposed to talking to folks out here as opposed to talking, well, you don't see me talking with clients, do you? Mm -hmm, no. <laughs> <laughs> there's confidentiality. But, and, and talking to you, and, you know, it's, I am arguably kind of different people when I'm doing that, mm -hmm. though I can, I, I remember it, you know, I can move easily from one to the other. Right. And you, you can do the same thing. 
So we're all multiple people. Mm -hmm. You know, and it, sometimes I'm a scared little boy, you know, sometimes I'm a wise grown up, you know, sometimes I'm a fun loving grandfather, you right. know, who knows what I am, I'm a curmudgeon sometimes, who knows what I am. <laughs> all of those things are all parts of authentic self. Mm -hmm. Dick Schwartz's idea is he does talk about a kind of true self, but what he means by that is this sort of central principle that is always about understanding all of these parts to be important and um, valid and benign. Even the troublesome ones, you need to work with them. And I, you know that, that overlaps with my concept of faith in the seven words that we, you know, be right. kind, don't panic and have faith. Mm -hmm. That notion that validity, essential validity is an axiom. We all start with that. So he talks about that true self that way. But what, what I find interesting is it's not the same thing as when people are saying, I have to be true to myself, you know, be true to yourself, figure out what's important to you. Mm -hmm. It's not that that's a bad idea, mm -hmm. but that other side of it, which is to say, yeah, maybe your true self you ought to look at a little. Maybe, <laughs> maybe it's like, yeah, maybe your true self's a how I guess we're sort of PG rated, so a, a hole, shall we say? <laughs> a jerk. A jerk. There we go. And I, you know, I'm a little stronger than that, you know. Not kind. Yes. Or, uh, or just maybe evil, mean. Yeah. Uh, nasty. And or I've said this to folks before. You know, in in 27 years, 27 plus years now of private practice, have I encountered people that I would say? Ah, I see the problem here. You're basically evil. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> you don't, nobody should be in a relationship with you. You know, yeah. very, very, very few, if any. You know, yeah. I just don't tend to go there. I don't assume that. The vast majority, and look, I've worked with zillions of people who have done nasty things, myself included. I mean, mm -hmm. who hasn't been nasty on occasion? But that, you know, in general, I can ascribe it to, gee, something, you're not feeling well. You know, you know I mean, you're hurt. Something's bothering right. you. You're panicking. Who knows? as opposed to just saying, oh, you're fundamentally evil. Mm -hmm. But there are aspects of all of our character, this is kind of <clears throat> going to what David Brooks is pointing out, that for a lot of cultures, people would say, no, the job of culture, the job of parenting, the job of being a, a decent person mm -hmm. is to rein in that stuff, not to express it. Yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> so that, that, that Th I mean, there you yeah. have it. Yeah, <laughs> indeed. <laughs> Do you want to, should we go to our letter? Should we go and, to our listener so letter? We'll apply this to a particular situation. Okay, so today we have a letter from Andy. Uh, Andy is male and he writes, I'm a 37-year-old man and I've been married to Emily for five years together for eight years. We have two young children, ages four and two. It seems lately that Emily criticizes everything I say or do. For example... A few nights ago, we were taking the kids out to dinner at a kid-friendly restaurant. I was wearing shorts and a t-shirt, and Emily said, You're not going out dressed like that. I didn't think I needed to dress up to go out to a kid's place. Or last week when I came home from work and was unloading about the idiots I work with, and she's telling me I'm wrong and that she's tired of my complaining. I don't need to be told I'm wrong, and any time I try to help her out by telling her there's a better way to do something, she gets all offended. I'm just being myself. Shouldn't I be able to be myself with my wife? Do I have to walk on eggshells all the time? How can I convince her to let her be me? No, to let me be me. Oh, I'm sorry. How can I convince her to let me be me? No, we don't want her to be me. <laughs> <laughs> to let me be to, me. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yes. Uh, yes. Why don't we convince... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> convince Emily to let Andy be himself? <laughs> yes. What do you think? I I'm curious. What's your gut reaction to any of this? Hmm. Well, it sounds like uh, they're kind of snippy with each other. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, they're snippy. Yeah. Uh, she's snipe, snipping at him and he's snipping at her. He's telling her how to do things and in return she's telling him how to do things, how to dress. I mean, there's a nicer way of saying, like, honey, can you put on a pair of pants that aren't ripped or, you know, the T-shirt that doesn't <laughs> look like you wore to a 70s Who concert or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> um, Hmm. And he's telling her how to run her life, you know, telling yeah. her that there is a better way to doing things that she's doing. So maybe it's a little bit of reacting um, to each other, yeah. uh, which which happens a lot of times when you have young kids are sleep deprived <laughs> and might have a different way of looking at things. And, you know, maybe he's coming home from work and 
she's had it with her two young kids. He doesn't say if she works outside of the home. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if she's home with the kids all day and then he comes out and unloads and, you know, she's probably thinking, you know, I've had, I've been digging kids out of mud. I've had, you know, potty training. I've, yeah. you know, I've had kids vomiting on me all day and you're telling me your boss is a jerk. I mean, come on, give me yeah. a break. Yeah. And I'm, well, I'll throw in, I mean, Andy, you know, a person writes a letter like this mm -hmm. or consults me, which is what writing that letter is. I mean, he hasn't made an appointment with me, but he could, you know what mm -hmm. I mean, in theory. I don't know exactly who this is, but in theory, he could. And lots of people have for uh, telling right. stories like this. And they do that because it starts to feel like, wow, are we really on the same team here? What's yeah, going on? It doesn't the, sound like it. Right yeah. Now. And that concept of wanting to feel like it's OK to be who you are with your spouse. Oh, my God. If if, you know. I want you to feel that way with me and I want to feel that and you make me feel that way with you. Do you know what I mean? We we seem to be happy with who each other is. Right. This is a recipe for lockdown. And the, indeed it is. And yes. And as we know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you start clamming up, you lose that intimacy. You do indeed. And so that's indeed, that's why this kind of thing comes up a lot, mm -hmm. you know, in my practice. The thing I want to focus on in this, though, is that idea you know, if you if you kind of read a little bit between the lines mm -hmm. uh, and you're I, I picked up like you did. It's like, well, they're both being kind of mean to each other or mm -hmm. you're not very nice to each other. Yeah. OK, fair enough. It's when we got to the part about, you know, last week when I came home from work, when I was unloading about the idiots I work with. That <laughs> part right there, that's that was interesting to me uh -huh. because it'd be interesting to hear from from either from both of them but i'm thinking emily you know if i were working with this as a, this couple mm -hmm. be interested to hear from emily what the effect of how he talks about that is on her mm -hmm. or how you know how she reacts to it because there's a and then you know and then he follows that up by saying when i try to help her out by telling her there's a better way to do something <laughs> which is another one i hear a lot almost always gendered in this direction uh -huh. though actually not always uh -huh. now now that i think of it um where you know your partner's telling you let me tell you a better way to do that which well i don't know how do you hear that how do i hear that yeah. i hear my first husband <laughs> <laughs> okay fair enough i hope you don't he hear me saying that he had a better way to, he, he could have run the world if everybody would only have listened to him yeah me yeah. everybody he worked with everybody in his life his kid you know the world would have just been a better place if everybody would have listened to him yeah so yeah so it, it ha did not have a good effect let me see. well i get that and he's my ex <laughs> the, fair enough the um <laughs> Well, I didn't know we were going to go in that direction exactly. <laughs> well, I know you asked. <laughs> I did ask. You yes. Asked what effect it had? What on effect? You. It's yeah. like it triggers. <laughs> and it, yeah, so there's a PTSD. trauma trigger there. Yeah, no, it, that makes sense. Yes, it was no. it was painful. Yes. They have that that sort of thing going on. And again, maybe I'm being uh, almost too obvious, but it's like, yeah, the reason that would be painful is that it feels like criticism. Mm -hmm. It doesn't just feel like help. Right. It, it does feels not like feel criticism. Like help. Yes. Yeah, and, and which is to say. And there's a there's an almost implicit accusation that why are you so stupid or incompetent that you couldn't figure this out? Right. You know, even if it's dressed up and I just want to be helpful, you mm -hmm. know, and and it's really tricky because that's it's that's not the same thing as actually offering to be helpful, which sometimes is welcome. You know, it's like, yes, I'd be. <laughs> thank you. Help me out, you know, mm -hmm. but it's when somebody and that's why I say it, I kind of put it together with the fact that this that, you know, Andy was unloading about the idiots I work with, you know, it's like. Huh. He sort of has a bit of a chip on his shoulder mm -hmm. about who he is right. and, you know, <laughs> whether it's OK for anybody else to be the way they are. And that concept of being let me be me when the me you're being is hurting someone else mm -hmm. is, you know, because I'm not arguing with his idea that he's just being him. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? I wouldn't sit there and say, no, that's not really you. Sounds like it is really you. Mm -hmm. That's like the, getting back to the title of our podcast. You know, if, if this is your authentic self, be somebody else. Right. You know, right? That there are ways in which we need to be able to look at that idea that our validity depends on the ways that we want to be, as opposed to our validity depends on nothing because we're, all, we're valid to start with. And that's a separate question from, okay, maybe I should figure out how not to be a jerk also. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so it'd be interesting to meet with this couple 
And I'm sure I would get, of course, a very different telling of the story from Emily, not, no doubt. No doubt. And, you know, and, and her, um, he's quoting her as being very impatient, as you pointed out. It's like, you know, the way she said he shouldn't be dressed like that wasn't mm -hmm. exactly nice and loving and compassionate or even open, you know. Mm -hmm. there's, there's all kinds of open ways where she could have just said something like, I'd rather you not be dressed like that. You know, <laughs> right. just just own it. You know, I'd rather you not be dressed like that. I prefer to you know sort of present a different image than that. And he could either quibble with that or what I would be advising him to do is just to get do off it. the topic. Have you yeah. ever noticed you go out to a restaurant and the women are generally dressed pretty nicely, uh -huh. and the men look like slobs. They're wearing like sloppy cargo pants <laughs> and like t-shirts and. Yeah, we you know why I'm laughing? Why? Because what you just said is, have you ever noticed? Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> Thereby confirming your point. <laughs> exactly your point. It There's a reason why so I don't notice. So often, you know, not that we go out to eat a lot, but, you know, even yeah. when we've been, you know, on vacation mm -hmm. and been like in like resorty places, the women will put on a nice sundress or, a, mm -hmm. you know, a nice outfit and, and the guys just look like <sighs> slobs, <Yeah>. you know? <laughs> <laughs> Which is, you know, that that tends to be my advice to the guys is, you know, well, so let me riff on that a little, okay. if I may, you know, because this is, a, I think it's a great example. Um, so the, a guy could well take that mm -hmm. and say, why aren't you letting me be me? Why are you so uptight about things like that? Just because you want it different, you know, why aren't you letting me be me? And what I tend to point out to the guys yeah. is that, it's interesting, and, and you know, I'll, I'll make this very gendered, you know, mm -hmm. you're a heterosexual couple. Yeah. You are not looking for, you know, a guy with a vulva, <laughs> and she's not looking for a woman with a penis, mm -hmm. you know. You actually wanted a woman, and you know what? That business of her wishing you'd be dressed better mm -hmm. is associated with all of that woman stuff that you love. Right. And if you don't recognize that, you're going to have a hard time being in relationship with an actual woman. And, you know, I feel uh, probably more entitlement to say that to men than I would say something comparable to women. I have pointed out to women on occasion, you know, if what you're looking for is a girlfriend with a penis, you, you don't have it. He's not going to think like women think. Again, I have to keep putting my little disclaimer. I'm not trying to stereotype totally. It's not like all women think alike and all men think alike. But there are some characteristic differences. Right. And so you know if well actually let me let me riff on that a little okay, bit okay go ahead riff. so i have heard not long ago i was talking with a couple where the woman was saying i just want to be able to speak you know tell tell him about what i'm feeling mm -hmm. the way i do to my girlfriends mm -hmm. and just have him listen the way my girlfriends listen and you you know much better than i do how women talk to women right but what i'm hearing from women is it's like you hear it with empathy and, you know, a sense of, wow, that must be really hard and, you know, kind of going with it mm -hmm. as opposed to saying, have you tried this? Uh -huh. You know, right. now there's some women who do that, but well, that's not what the women are talking about. You right. Know? And so it's like she's saying, why did why do men have to do that? You know, why does she have to do that? And I could say to men, hey, yeah, you need to learn how to listen like a woman. Well, first of all, we're not. Mm -hmm. We're not going to. I mean, it's it's not going to work. And what I tend to say to men in that, and again, obviously, I have, this, I have qualifications here, you know, because <laughs> I think this, this works for me. I don't know if it works for all men. But what I often point out to men is, you know, our masculine um, urge to take care of our wife, take mm -hmm. care of our woman, you know, says the caveman here, you know, mm -hmm. is, I, I, I would simply assert isn't a bad thing. Mm -hmm. In fact, lots of heterosexual women are looking for that, right? I, you're the expert there. So that notion that we're looking for those sorts of characteristically masculine or feminine characteristics isn't a terrible thing at all. And moreover, to tell a man, so you're just going to have to not, you know, not attempt to solve the problem doesn't work. What I think does work is to point out to the man, no, when she's, what she's telling you is there is in fact a problem to solve. Even though she's saying, I wish you wouldn't just try to solve the problem. Mm -hmm. there, from a male perspective, no, there is a problem to solve. You're just solving the wrong one. The problem to, can you guess? I don't want to play a game, but I'm playing a game. Can you guess? Can I, okay. Can guess you guess what's, what would I, what do I point out to the man that there is? She, each, the woman is saying in so many words, I don't want you to solve my problem. I just want you to listen to me. Right. So she's announcing there's no, it's not about solving the problem. I'm saying to the man, you know, I hear why she's saying that, but you're not going to believe it 
you know, the man wants to solve the problem. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying, no, actually, there is a problem for you to solve. It's just not the one you think. Oh, he's the problem. Well, he's the <laughs> wow, says the woman, right? <laughs> I mean, he's he's being the problem from her perspective at that moment. But from his perspective, yeah, he he cares about, let's say, his wife, right? Mm -hmm. He cares about his wife. Mm -hmm. It's tugging at him that she seems to be upset. Mm -hmm. It's he wants to do something about it. Okay. And she's telling him what he's doing is just making it worse. There is a problem to solve there, but it's not the one that he's attempting to solve that's making it worse. It's not the one that says, have you tried this with your coworker who's causing you difficulty, you know? That's not the point. The problem to solve, again, this may sound too simplistic, you know. Okay. But again, for men, I think it, <laughs> we, we don't always recognize this. The problem is she needs you to listen. That is a problem mm -hmm. that you can actually learn to solve. Now, the woman wouldn't say it that way because it, for women, it's like, why do I have to tell you that? You know, it's like, don't you already know that? And for men, no, we don't already know that. But isn't that the case in, in this situation, is he's wanting his wife to listen to him, mm -hmm. and she's not wanting to listen? Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it's, that is true. It, it, it clearly works in both directions in the, that example. He's wanting, you know, if he could say to her, can you be a little nicer about how, you, you know, I mean, that, that kind of hurts when you just sort of, you know, mm -hmm. tell me I'm being a slob, you mm -hmm. know, as opposed to saying, I, you know, if you told me, it would please you for me to dress up a little. Mm -hmm. I would feel good about that because I like to please you. Yeah. I like to put a smile on your face. But if you criticize me, it doesn't work. Now, obviously, that's not going to play very well with her because he's so critical. Right. No, I was talking about the listening part where she's not listening to him when he unloads after, when he ah, comes home from work. That yes. part. Is it, isn't that what he's looking for? Like you were saying, you women just want men to listen to them. It sounds like that's what Andy wants in this situation. Yeah. He wants his wife just to listen to him. He, because he he's got to find, you know, he's got to unload because he's working all day with what he calls idiots. Uh, so he's got to find a, a space where he can be listened to See, and I, feel validated. But I think the problem you run into with this mm. is when he is referring to those idiots he works with mm -hmm. and follows and follows that up by saying, and my wife's an idiot too. He didn't say <laughs> that in so many words. Not in so many words. But she, she's pretty sure that mm -hmm. he thinks she's an idiot. Yeah. Much yeah, of the well, time. Well, if he's always telling her how to do things. Yeah. yeah. And that's what she's upset by. Mm -hmm. she's, you know, if he came home and said, oh, God, work is just so stressful. You know, she might be inclined if if they're going if things are going well. She might be inclined to say, "Oh, let me give you a neck rub," you know, or mm -hmm. or let me or gee, poor baby, you know, and not in a smarmy way, but you know what I mean. That yeah, yeah. that sense of let me comfort you, you know, sure. I'm here for you, you know. But what she's hearing in him is, "Oh, you're a jerk to them, like you're a jerk to me." Uh huh. And she's not going to have a lot of patience for that. And he's appealing to her to have patience without recognizing that he's part of this situation. And that can get really dicey. Yeah, so he's part of the problem. Well, yes. I mean, there, as I say, we're, look, we're all part of the problem. <laughs> that's, it's, it's funny. I'm, I'm just in, in the, the book I'm writing on, I'm working on now, which I'm still not giving away the title of, but folks, I've mentioned I'm working on a book. Right. I happen to be working on a section that is about, um, I'm comparing mediation with couples therapy. Oh. And mediation is an important thing. It's a really valuable service. That I'm sure some of our listeners have either been through it or certainly know about it. You know, for in couples context, it right. most often comes up when they're divorcing. Right. And they are having a hard time working out the details of the agreement. And they, you know, as people say, the devil's in the details, you know. And a good mediator, and I have great respect for mediators, a good mediator will work with the couple in such a way that they'll come to an agreement that that is workable, you know, that they both say, all right, this may not have been exactly what I wanted, but I can live with it and durable in the sense that they really do accept it. And then it'll actually solve some problems or it'll reduce anxiety. Sure. It's a stability thing. Mm -hmm. Like in my stability intimacy bit, mm -hmm. it, it fosters stability. And if you have, especially if you have uh, parents who are divorcing and they have to be in touch with respect to the kids, right. it's really important that they have, they develop a stable relationship and an agreement, a nice you know, in, in on paper agreement uh, can help with that if it's a good agreement. And mm -hmm. it takes a good mediator to be able to do that and invite people to get to that place where they can actually come to an agreement. So that's what mediation is. What do you need in a mediator? You need the mediator to be neutral. 
Right. It needs to be very clear. It's They're not a judge exactly, mm -hmm. right? They're not an arbitrator. That's a right. whole different process. They're not making the decision for you. Mm -hmm. But you sure need to both, both parties need to feel like you are working so that, you know, you are neutral in this dispute. It is a dispute. And your job is to get us to agree to something so it's no longer a dispute. And that's your job. And in that sense, you need the, the, the um, mediator to be a neutral party. What I'm saying is in couples therapy, it's really interesting. This, this is all a riff on the idea that, oh, we're all part of the problem. You mm -hmm. know? In couples therapy, I claim I, there's no way I am a neutral third party because I'm not really a third party. I know that sounds a little weird to say it that mm -hmm. way. In other words, it's not that I'm not taking sides. Of course, I'm not taking sides. But in an intimate conversation, there are no sides. Yeah. That's what the part that I find fascinating. When you can actually get to that place of saying, oh, this is how you're feeling. This is how I'm feeling. This is where I'm coming from. You know, mm -hmm. isn't that interesting? You know, mm -hmm. that's what a, an intimate conversation does. And that differs a lot from negotiating an agreement, because when you negotiate an agreement, you know the game you're playing. You know what I mean? If you're negotiating a divorce agreement, you know the product is a divorce with an agreement. Right. You know, in an intimate conversation in therapy, even if both parties are pretty sure you're going to divorce or they're pretty sure you're not going to divorce or whatever, mm -hmm. you don't know what you're working toward exactly, except that it should somehow be healed. Yeah. That's a much different concept than coming to an agreement. I hadn't thought of it that way. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and it's fascinating because a lot of times, look, this is in the, in the uh, section of my book where I'm basically busting some myths about mm -hmm. what I think are myths about couples therapy. Mm -hmm. And one of the myths is, oh, the therapist needs to be a neutral third party. You mm -hmm. know, people will often, people often comment and appreciate that. You know, like after a first session, I just, just last week, somebody was telling me, it's really helpful that we, you're a, you're a third party that we could, you know, bring this to and you can hear us both, you know. Right, of course, that's true. Mm -hmm. But I'm not really a third party in the sense that a mediator is because we don't know exactly what they're going to agree to or not agree. It, uh, what I was starting to say there is couples will often come thinking what they need to do is come up with an agreement. I see this a lot. You know, one or the other or both will say, we just need to agree on this and then we'll be fine. <laughs> and a lot of times my job is to say, don't agree too quickly because if you don't really agree, it won't work. Mm -hmm. One of the stories I'm telling in this new book, uh, which I don't mind sharing with you folks, is um, many, many years ago, I, was, uh, I went to a presentation. It was some sort of you know, continuing education presentation mm -hmm. by a fellow psychologist who I didn't know well. I think I had talked to once or twice. Um, and she was presenting this method that she had devised for helping extremely conflictual couples come to an agreement. It was like on paper, an agreement on paper that would help them resolve these horrible issues they were having with their kids and, you know, whatever. And of course, in presenting the example she gave, she, of course, changed the names, right? Mm -hmm. Funny thing, <laughs> I had worked with that family. Oh, wow. They had split up and I had... I had contact with that family, very recent contact with that family. So I had been told the story of that agreement, mm -hmm. which the presenter hadn't known. Uh -huh. And the reason I know this is the presenters, the, the person who arranged this agreement, her job appropriately was to help them come up with this agreement, which they signed. You know, the expression, they violated it before the ink was dry. <laughs> yeah. This was literally true, literally yeah. true. On the way out the door, the guy was already completely violating what he agreed to. On the way out the door, I don't remember the details, it doesn't matter, but he uh -huh. was not doing what he just said he, he was doing what he just said he wasn't going to do anymore. <laughs> and things went to hell in a handbasket. Wow. You know? the, the person who did the agreement had no knowledge of this because she was done. You know, right. They said, thank she you very much, paid her bill, and that was that. Right. She, in good faith, she mm -hmm. did her thing. But it was a really interesting thing for me to see that because... You can come up with what you think is an agreement, but if it isn't really an agreement, it ain't going to work. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times people coming to therapy think what they need to do is, well, I, you know, I've, I've had this frequently with couples where one, you know, one of them will say, oh, if what I'm doing is bothering you, that's easy. I won't do it. Mm -hmm. Now, there are things that's happened. You're right. There's there's stuff you said, you know, which yeah, I always go to the wipe the sink. You know, I love that example. I just love that example. Would you please wipe the sink? 
did never, you know, it's like I never noticed the men being zlubs in restaurants, you know. <laughs> I never noticed that the sink, and I think I've said this before too, I have to tell you, it, that was years ago that you did that. And since then, I now... I'm really annoyed if I, if I leave, you never do, if I leave the sink wet, I, that's like, I immediately dry it. It annoys me. It, I've internalized it, you know. But the, no, the funny thing being, that's an example of something that that was an agreement. I was delighted. It was nothing. It was mm -hmm. nothing to agree to. Oh, mm -hmm. you want that? That'll make you happy? It costs me nothing? <laughs> Why wouldn't I want to make you happy? <laughs> you know, the things that are dicey yeah. is if somebody wants somebody to agree to something that just ain't them. And I've worked with you know, several couples over the years where one of them is offended by the other's offers of help. It's funny that it's sort of similar to Andy and, and talking about Emily, you know, uh -huh. you know, help her out by, you know, and the other, it's like, but that's who I am. I mean, I don't know how to not offer you help, uh -huh. you know, right. and that can be really tricky. If you, if you come up with an agreement, it won't hold if it isn't, if you don't really agree to it. You know, if there's enough parts of you, I'm not going to say authentic self because there's a bunch of authentic selves. Right. But if there's enough parts of you that are saying, I, I can't agree to that. It's just not who I am. If, if you know, if God forbid, if you said to me, yeah, stop that music making business, you know, <laughs> well, then you need a different guy. I mean, that's, that's, that's who I am. You know, and look, you're not going to say that to me. Right. You know, and I wouldn't say anything. To, you know, I wouldn't want you to be other than who you are either. But sometimes people do. Mm hmm. And that is tricky. Yeah. Oh, while I'm on that, you know, that sometimes comes up in the sexual domain. Somebody will say, ooh, I want you to be, you know, I'm really into, you know, um, S&M or mm -hmm. I'm really into bondage or whatever they may be into. I really need that, you know, or want it. And the other person is saying, I'm, ho I'm horrified by that. Right. Well, that, you know, they can come up with an agreement. I'm not trying to say that has to be fatal even to a sexual relationship, but... That's a tricky one if one person's sense of who they are is just incompatible with the other. Well, a classic example of that is, oh, by the way, I'm gay. Ain't yeah, work. That can put a damper on a relationship well, yeah. <laughs> and if it's a heterosexual relationship. It, well, exactly. That's what yeah. the person wants, yes. Yeah, yeah, and that, that's, the, that's the thing. There's some things that are just no amount of agreeing is going to help right. ultimately. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's another difference between mediation and... Um, Couples and therapy. couples therapy, because in the case of mediation, some well, actually, this happens in mediation, too. Sometimes the mediator will realize or the, the parties will realize, oh, we're not going to come to agreement this way. Mm -hmm. The difference with mediation is there's a judge behind them. So if they don't come up with an agreement, some judge will, quote unquote, <laughs> agree for them. Mm -hmm. You know, they'll say, well, then we'll impose an agreement. on right. you. This is what's going to happen. And um but, but that's you know that doesn't work if you're in a couple. That doesn't work you if you're in a couple. Stay in a couple. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So boy, that that led us quite a. <laughs> that led us as far afield uh, uh, for the, from this letter, but uh, yeah. we don't want you to be somebody else. We just want you to be a kinder self. How about that? That's certainly that, a way that's to what say it. Comes it. down to right. And and you know I, I'll throw in also um, even that idea of letting you be you. No, you're already being you. Uh, she's objecting to some of the ways that you're being you. Mm -hmm. So, and maybe he's yeah. objecting. He's objecting to some of the ways she's being her also, too. Also true. So I think uh, they they need to get a, a little grip on reality and yeah. on each other here, and uh, have a have a sit down and talk to each other about the ways they're talking to yeah. each other. And and look on an optimistic note. Mm -hmm. Once you once you actually can have an intimate conversation, you know, which, and that's the kind of thing that for folks who are in this sort of situation, writing to a therapist, mm -hmm. I would tend to say, yeah, that's what couples therapy is for. Right. You know, go talk to a therapist because if you can be invited into an actual intimate conversation where you can both really both can be you in ways that are also considerate and compassionate, right? then you discover a lot of stuff can shift. Mm -hmm. Then you can relax. You know, that feeling of constantly being disapproved of mm -hmm. is just horrible in in you know most people don't want to feel like that right and so to the extent that that can be uh put in a different context i've seen it change quite a lot so i hope yeah because you know, they're if they stay like this they're on the road to you know splitsville yeah, yeah. and it, you know it's going to happen sooner or later and uh, you know it's just not going to be a good relationship getting there so go for therapy now <laughs>
Indeed. Funny how so many of our, our letters end up saying, gee, maybe I ought to talk to a therapist. <laughs> Can't imagine why or where that would come from. <laughs> you know, just seems like a good idea. Well, I'm sure in your experience, the couples you have worked with have found it helpful. Uh, many of them have. Mm -hmm. I can't claim that all of them have, right. I'm sure. Uh, that's, a, that's another one. Maybe that's a topic for another uh, podcast is what constitutes success in couples therapy. Mm -hmm. It's not always the couple staying together. Right. But at least if they're going to part, it's, it's not the possibly the animosity that they had. Or maybe it's the realization that, oh, we just don't belong together. Yeah. Yeah. Instead of just being so angry and hateful. Yeah, exactly. And look, and, and talk about neutrality or not, you know, <clears throat> I have a definite bias mm -hmm. toward helping people stay together and be happy about it. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? That's that's where my heart sings, do you know? I do not, I can't, it doesn't matter if I wanted to or not, I don't impose that on other people. Mm -hmm. I absolutely respect that our system of marriage allows for divorce. Right. I think that's really important because otherwise you end up in, when you still end up in, you know, abusive or oppressive relationships. But I, you know, I certainly, I have more fun when, when the result of my work with a couple, and you know what, I'm going to qualify that statement. I was about to say I have more fun when they stay together. It's not true. <laughs> what feels so good to me is this sense of shared intimacy. It's like, because I'm just, I'm thinking of one in particular, it doesn't matter who, this particular couple that clearly they figured out they needed to, to split. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was so heartfelt for both sides. It was so, and they so loved each other. Mm -hmm. This is one of those ones. I mean, it, it wasn't this exactly, but it could have been like one of them figured out they were gay, that mm -hmm. kind of thing, you know, didn't happen to be that exactly in this case, but variation on that theme. Mm -hmm. And just, they just figured out it wasn't going to work. And, and yet they were so loving. Yeah. And so, um, and I just had such good, I was, I was getting such good feeling about how it's going to be for them. And it was still very painful for them because they loved each other. It's still very painful that they were splitting up, but it was going to be okay. And, and they, I know that the work was contributed to that. And that just felt good I'm from mm -hmm. an ego basis. You know, it's like, oh, good. I feel that's why I'm called to this work. And I'm using that kind of, you know, quasi religious terminology, you know, vocation, mm -hmm. right. the notion that it's a calling. Right. I, that's what I feel called to. It's to participate in that kind of healing. So. Well, good. I would say that your patients or clients are very fortunate to have you as their therapist. That's very sweet of you to say. I'm, I'm, if, if all of them felt that way, that would be great. I'm sure that's not true. <laughs> but, <laughs> whatever. We're all human. We all do the best we can. Well, I hope that's helpful to you, Andy, and good luck to you and Emily, and I uh, hope you find a good therapist. <laughs> ah. And so... so if you have a question that you would like me and Bruce to discuss on the show, you can email us. You can email Bruce at ctin7.com or Judy in C at ctin7.com or just go to our website, ctin7.com. That's the numeral seven, mm -hmm. which CT is for couples therapy. So ctin7.com. Mm -hmm. And uh, additionally, if you would like to be interviewed on our show, we have a slot on our website where you can sign up to be interviewed. Or if you have suggestions of people you'd like us to interview, send them our way. Yes, indeed. And that's how we have gotten lots of the folks we have interviewed. We have uh, at least one already set up, a couple in the mm -hmm. in the hopper right, uh, right. that we're working on. In and a so, few weeks, we'll be interviewing them. Yep. Yeah. So that's, um, that's stuff we enjoy doing, and I hope you enjoy viewing and listening to. Yeah. And let us know, just uh, give us some feedback, too. Let us know that you're listening, and, and, you know, we always love to hear from folks, and occasionally we do, and it's always fun to to get that, mm -hmm. uh, get and that if feedback. you're reading the book, we'd love for you to interview, uh, interview it, <laughs> to review it yes. uh, on Amazon. So I know that's where a lot of people see it. So that's reigniting the spark: why stable relationships lose intimacy and how to get it back. Yes, indeed. And, and uh, we also, oh yes, of forgot course. to mention, we have merch. We have our couples therapy. In seven words, beautiful mugs and t-shirts available for purchase with our logo on one side and our saying, be kind, don't panic, and have faith on the other side. A nice way to drink your coffee, tea, hot chocolate, or any beverage of choice. Yes, an inspiring message there indeed. Mm -hmm. And so until next time. Remember, be kind. Don't panic. And have faith. Mm -hmm.